Good morning, Mayor and Commissioners. Maps, Rubio, Ryan, Gonzalez, Wheeler. Order and decorum. Good morning. Good morning. Welcome to the Portland City Council. To testify before council in person or virtually, you must sign up in advance on the council agenda at www.portland.gov slash council slash agenda. Information on engaging the city council can be found on the council clerk's webpage. The presiding officer preserves order and decorum during city council meetings. The presiding officer determines the length of testimony. Individuals generally have three minutes to testify unless otherwise stated. A timer will indicate when your time is done. Disruptive conduct such as shouting, refusing to conclude your testimony when your time is up, or interrupting others' testimony or council deliberations will not be allowed. If you cause a disruption, a warning will be given. Further disruption will result in ejection from the meeting. Anyone who fails to leave once ejected is subject to arrest for trespass. Additionally, council may take a short recess and reconvene virtually. Your testimony today should address the matter being considered. When testifying, please state your name for the record. Your address is not necessary. Disclose if you are a lobbyist, and if you are representing an organization, please identify it. For testifiers joining virtually, please unmute yourself once the council clerk calls your name. Thank you. Thank you very much. All right, good morning. Before we get started today, I just want to quickly inform everybody that we'll be taking a recess at 11.20 a.m. The recess is to accommodate a nationwide drill by FEMA that tests our alert and warning system. So hopefully we will be disrupted, uh, both in terms of our cell phone, but also our broadcast will be disrupted as well. So during the test, uh, since televisions, radios, and all phones will be interrupted, we'll go ahead and just take a break. We don't know exactly how long that break will last, but it could last up to 30 minutes. I want to take this moment to remind those here in the chambers and listening to sign in for public alerts at publicalerts.org. That's my shameless plug for the morning. These alerts ensure that we stay informed regarding hazards in our area. So thank you everyone for that. We'll start with communications first item. I believe there's a number of people who want to come up together. Is that correct? So why don't we go ahead and read, uh, it looks like two people for Frog Ferry, is that correct? The transportation stuff. Okay, good, all right, frog. good. So the first four then, why don't we go ahead and have 821822, 823, and 824, the first four individuals, you can come on up together. And uh, would you just like the, the uh, time to be collective? So 12 minutes total, or how, how would you like to do it? Sure. We'll see how good we are with timeliness. <laughs> All right. Very good. So why don't you set the timer for 12 minutes, please? Okay. Um, and I'll quickly read through the titles. Yeah, please. And Go ahead. Timer. Item 821, request of Susan Bladholm to address council regarding public-private partnership. 822, request of Soren Garber to address council regarding funding for the frog Ferry Pilot 823, request of Jennifer Schloming to address council regarding mass transit for St. John's. 824, request of James Paulson to address council regarding low income transportation. Good morning. Good morning, Mayor Wheeler and city commissioners. My name is Susan Bladholm and I am the founder of Frog Ferry. I'm here to talk with you today about what could be a really easy win, including Frog Ferry in the Regional Transportation Plan Constrained Project List. For at least 20 years, Portland City Council has considered a passenger ferry. In 2006, the city conducted the Willamette River Water Taxi Study. In 2017, when PBOT proposed a ferry operational feasibility study and it wasn't funded, we picked up the task. Commissioner Saltzman was in office back then. In 2019, we conducted that study and the results indicate that it's feasible, it's affordable, it's an excellent way to reduce greenhouse gas emissions, improve community resilience while getting Portlanders back downtown and out on their river. We know the city's budget is tight and your staffing resources are limited. That's why our grassroots effort has delivered about $30 million in value in planning, community outreach, and research over the past six years. And Mayor, you have a number of packets there in front of you that show a number of the different plans. I'm hoping that you will pass them around and share some of those resources. Are those up there in the files? 
Is, you is see in there? <laughs> Just take a peek at them and pass them down. But it, I want you guys to have a sense of the work that's been done over the past six and a half years. There are 70 letters of support from major employers and institutions to join the hundreds you and your predecessors have received in your offices, including a letter from Oregon's congressional delegation. The best practice case study that you help fund under Mayor Wheeler's support several years ago is in there. The operational fee feasibility study that you helped fund $40,000 that went towards the $350,000 plan was under Commissioner Udaley. The finance plan, which is even more robust today given PSAF and FTA infrastructure bill resources. The federal FTA funding request, which was sponsored by Commissioner Hardesty and had a 5-0 vote in our partnership and working together. The 2018 Regional Transportation Plan, you'll find included. We're in Chapter 8. All we need today is to be included in the constrained project list, a, a list that's comprised of hundreds of transit projects. Also, you'll find the River Reconnaissance Report, the Demand Modeling Report, and many more. We have now cycled through four PBOT commissioners, and we thank Commissioner Maps for his leadership and support. City Council has adopted the Climate Investment Plan, and now we need action, not talk, but actual projects to provide climate solutions for our community. We have operated with integrity, data, community inv involvement, and a spirit of collaboration, and we have been equipped with the nation's best ferry expertise. I thank the many supporters who are here today and listening in online, and the 2,600 supporters we have on our listserv. You guys know we're in the midst of a climate emergency. We're in a crisis to rebuild our city. We cannot afford to be derailed due to what should be a very simple step that has cost us nine months of inaction. To not step up and vote Frog Ferry into the Regional Transportation Plan constrained project list is a clear sign of sticking with the status quo. Please help us move through the bureaucracy and commit your vote today. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, folks, folks, uh, I, I, if you can stop the clock for just a sec. Um, that cuts into their time. So um, if, if you want at the end, go ahead and apply, but let's let them get through their presentation. You can restart the clock. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning, Mayor morning. Wheeler, Commissioner. Am I? Commissioner Ryan, Commissioner Maps. My name is Soren Garber. I'm a Southwest Oregon I'm a Portland resident. I'm a friend of the Frog Ferry. I'm also an independent transportation planning consultant. And I completed some analyses about population and employment and transportation characteristics in the St. John's area. St. John's experiences the highest air pollution levels in the region. The Frog Ferry will remove 95 million pounds of hydrocarbon emissions each year from the St. John's area. Transit usage is relatively high, but uh, you speak to any transit commuter in St. John's and they'll tell you it's very unreliable. The travel time, it's very slow. Um, it takes about 65 minutes on the 4 and 44 to get from Lombard in the St. John's Business District to downtown. The Frog Ferry at Cathedral Park Dock will take 25 minutes. Over 12,000 residents live within one mile of um, the Frog Ferry test, pilot test stops. Um, and if, as downtown is within that one mile radius, we have 84,000 workers. So it's an extremely convenient access to the Frog Ferry. The Frog Ferry will deliver commuters directly to Max, the streetcar, aerial tram, et cetera, whereas St. John's residents now take the 4 and the 44, often have to transfer to the yellow line. Then from the yellow line, they get on the red, the orange, the blue line. It's, it takes them a very long time. In addition, the Frog Ferry can be an integral and primary part of our emergency preparedness um, and evacuation during a major event, such as when ferries were used um, to replace the damaged Oakland Bay Bridge after the Loma Prieta earthquake and how thousands of New Yorkers escaped um, uh, during the 9-11 terror attacks. The Bay Area ferry system is actually called WIDA, Water Emergency Transportation Authority. And we have a lot of support from the Harbor Master, the Fire Marshal, and been in conversations with PBEM staff about the use. 
During our council hearing in April 2022, Commissioners um, Ryan and Rubio and Mayor Wheeler all asked us to show that we, to demonstrate that we can be integrated with TriMet. And at last week's um, TriMet board meeting, both GM DeSue and the board president Gonzalez acknowledged publicly that the Frog Ferry can both supplement, complement, and be integrated very well with, um, the frog, with the Frog Ferry. I've been a transportation planner my entire career and I've never seen a more cost-effective, operationally ready, directly beneficial and green transportation service than the Frog Ferry service. It will cost the city zero dollars. I've been writing grants for Peabot. I'll even write the grant for free. <laughs> um, it significantly helps the BIPOC and low-income populations of St. John's and other peninsula neighborhoods. It produces zero emissions. Its right-of-way and docks are available. Being on the river, as we've seen with all the test runs we've had, brings smiles to people's faces and reduces their stress levels. Thank you. Thank you. Morning. Morning. My name is Jennifer Schloming. I live in St. John's, having returned to PDX after a 24-year hiatus in Ashland. Before leaving Portland in 94, I served as personal staff to Neil Goldschmidt and Connie McCready. My focus was transportation. The downtown transit mall and max trains became Portland's trade for the proposed Mount Hood Freeway. Portland was recognized nationally for its bold innovation in the transportation sector. I'm here this morning on behalf of Frog Ferry. Although in the late 70s we knew river transit was a clear next step after the, the, ma the mall and the trains, the federal funds for ferries just weren't there yet. With the Biden infrastructure funds, they are now. I appreciate your willingness to serve this moment in the city's history. But if in tackling the obvious issues, you ignore the opportunity of a challenging idea, you will surely fail to call in the greatest good that might come. I know you understand the window of huge federal grant opportunities that Portland will lose if you don't partner with Frog Ferry now. I ask you to imagine a downtown with a return of commuters and visitors walking, shopping, embarking and debarking from the ferry dock at River Place. The ferry can help us reclaim the commons as our home. St. John's residents, as you have heard, could get to and from the downtown in 25 minutes by ferry in comparison to a bus ride that now takes over an hour. We are a BIPOC community, a close, close community of mostly lower to middle income folk many of whom depend on public transit. The appalling lack of access to express transit out here keeps many from seeking better jobs elsewhere in the city. It also keeps visitors from discovering the quirky and wonderful signature of this community. And that lack of access has cost businesses here dearly. North Lombard has a growing tally of shuttered storefronts that is at a minimum disheartening and maybe more honestly, colossally dispiriting. St. John's deserves the same commercial vigor as Alberta, Multnomah Village, Hawthorne, Clinton, or the Northwest. Folks won't come if they don't know about us, and it isn't easy to get here. The city's handshake with Frog Ferry could help us rebuild the thriving retail core those of us living here deserve. As you know, OMSI is ready to partner with Frog Ferry to offer river education for all Portland schools. <coughs> Our children are our inheritance. They are the reason we try so damned hard to get it right. Please do not miss this moment to do that. You have the power to make a visionary transportation choice on behalf of Portland again. I am begging you to take action and vote Frog Ferry into Metro's RTP constrained project list. At the suggestion of Frog Ferry supporter, former city commissioner Mike Lindbergh, I offer you the many, many letters of support, not only from the St. John's Neighborhood Association and the Downtown Neighborhood Association, but numerous other neighborhood associations and civic and public leaders who join me in this request. Thank you. Thank you. Hello, <clears throat> my name is James Paulson and I am the board chair for the Friends of Frog Ferry. And I like, <clears throat> excuse me, I come up here as a representative, not only of the board and the, all the volunteers um, that have come and helped us bring the Frog Ferry to this point, but also all the people in the neighborhoods that could be affected by this. If you knew the number of neighborhood association meetings and so forth, where we've got nothing but positive um, out 
like outpouring from people and how much they say, why isn't the ferry here right now? And we've worked very hard to bring that ferry. And right now we are at a point where we cannot move this work forward without your support. Inaction on your part will result in failure on our part. And that failure on our part is not just the failure of the Frog Ferry, but it's the failure of our community. Because we are not being, we were not being innovative. We need to keep that innovation. When we talk about our downtown being vibrant, it's because of innovators. It's because people came and had ideas and moved them forward. They changed the status quo. That's what we're looking for here. We're not looking for money. What we're looking for is support and cooperation. We've done everything that we can do, and now it's on you. We need your help. We need your help now, and we need your help so that we can continue to support the neighborhoods of St. John's and also the downtown in our pilot. Please give us your support. Say that you'll support us in this. We can't do it without you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Appreciate it. Perfect timing. <laughs> I don't think we've ever had four people testify at the same time and actually finish to the second in the time frame. So that was very well done. Commissioner Maps. Um, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Mayor. I want to thank Susan, Soren, Jennifer, and James uh, for their testimony uh, today and for their advocacy and enthusiasm for this project. Um, I support this project. I share your vision. Um, I respect you. And because I respect you, I'm also going to speak some truth right now, uh, and this is going to be difficult. Um, I think everyone on this council and people all throughout this region um, can understand and embrace the vision of bringing a ferry to the city. I will also tell you that um, the headwinds for this project are strong. If you've paid attention to some of the conversations we've had in this chamber over the last several weeks, you have seen me come to my colleagues and talk about the grim economic fact um, that PBOT's budget is um, fundamentally unstable and flawed. Uh, I'm busy trying to figure out how to cut $32 million from PBOT's budget. That's about a third of our discretionary dollars. Um, which is a challenge, which also means that expanding and creating um, a new mode of transportation, even one which I think would be a um, great benefit to our community, is awfully difficult. Now, um, I'm sure some folks will say, um, but uh, Commissioner Mapp, so listen, we're not asking for dollars from PBOT, but in terms of how this fits together, if I put the ferry on the regional transportation plan, it means I don't put some other um, infrastructure project um, into that slot uh, that I kind of have to get done, which the feds might reasonably um, provide us some help with. I also want to talk about some of the um, other challenges that we face here. Um, you know, I think this project would be great um, if our partners across the river um, uh, in Vancouver were enthusiastic, but um, our elected leaders in Vancouver have told me in no uncertain terms that um, they do not plan to uh, build a frog ferry terminal in Vancouver. Um, and I will also tell you, um, uh, our partners over at TriMet have also expressed concerns to me about um, how this project would, would interact with their um, transportation system. Now, I see some heads shaken, but, you know, I, um, I've talked to them and I, I, they tell me that, you know, one of the, your requests to them is that, you know, if we, if we, move forward with this project. Uh, I think they've been asked to withdraw some bus lines uh, um, that serve the neighborhoods that we're talk talking about. And I am not a TriMet expert, but I, I will tell you what, I will tell you the kind of reception that I receive when I talk to our regional partners about trying to move this forward. Now, uh, we are not making a vote today. Um, and I know um, this conversation will continue over the next couple of weeks. Um, but because I respect you and I, um, 
and I want to um, honor your activism. I also just feel obliged to actually be straight with you about what our current field position is. Um, and of course, you can reach out to my office, you can reach out to my uh, colleagues on council, um, you know, you can reach out to our partners in Vancouver and our um, friends over at TriMet. Um, I am just trying to tell you the truth. Um, and I recognize uh, it is um, upsetting to many and disappointing, um, but in my professional evaluation, that is where we're at today. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank, thank you. Could I, could I just ask a basic question? Yeah. Um, and and I'm, I apologize for the simplicity of my question. I've never been uh, the PBOT commissioner. So the, the RTP is a list that is generated. Is that generated by the city or is it through JPAC? Uh, it ultimately goes through JPAC. Through JPAC. And, and there is a limit to the number of projects that can be on the list, or how does that work? Yeah, yeah so let's put it that way. OK. And so, Su Susan, could I just ask you a follow-up question? Are you, you're asking that it be put on the list. You're not asking for funding or any commitment. Is that an accurate statement? Sorry, hundreds of projects. We're in the regional transportation plan. You just have to get on the constrained project list. This okay. is one on a tenth scale. There's no limit to the number of projects to be included. Okay, and, and is from your perspective, and for the record, you said no. Uh, is there any, is there any um, commitment that you are implying or suggesting on the part of the city if we put this on the list? No. Okay. And and so I'll, I'll, we'll talk amongst ourselves, but that's that's right. helpful for me and I appreciate it. Thank you. Thanks for your testimony. Uh, still on communications, 825, next individual, please. Request of Steve Cantor to address council regarding 911 problems and a solution. Good morning, Steve. How are you today? Good. <clears throat> Mayor Wheeler, Commissioners Maps and Ryan, I appreciate your time this morning. I want to talk about 911 today. It's rather appropriate since uh, we have the FEMA uh, alert at 1120. 911 is a problem. I want to give a little bit of a background story just so you have the context and hopefully we can talk about ways to improve the situation and uh, fix a situation that really is not acceptable. I came to Portland in 1971 and actually after taking the bar, the first job I had was in City Hall. Uh, and I must say it's uh, producing optimism to see so many citizens here today. They're, I know you don't always have so many coming with constructive suggestions, uh, whatever the result is of their effort. It's, a, it's an optimistic sign for the city that city citizens are still engaged. When I came here, downtown was in trouble. Uh, I worked for a very short time while I was waiting for bar results for a city commissioner in this building who was getting ready to be the mayor, Neil Goldschmidt. And with the help of lots of other people, uh, the city solved its problems, moved forward, and became a model. As all of you know, and you've been working hard on them, the city faces many, many problems right now. We're not going to solve them all. You're not going to solve them all. But 911, I believe, is fixable. I want to take you back to July. July 11th, I, with some trepidation, packed a backpack and got ready to meet a friend who had started in Mexico to hike four days on the Pacific Crest Trail. Uh, I knew I wasn't ready, but I did it anyway. Um, for what it's worth, my car was broken into that night. Thankfully, I felt lucky because I had not put all of my materials in the car. Uh, I got up, no window was broken, they bent a little chrome, no big deal. Drove down to Ashland, had an unbelievably wonderful time on the trail. I hope you all get a chance to do that if you haven't for four days. Drove back Saturday the 15th of July, was driving over to pick up my dog from a friend's house and turned right on uh, Cesar Chavez, as most of you know, uh, a woman was killed there. Uh, I was driving in the left lane, ready to turn on Hawthorne eventually, and a car came screaming by and hit her on the sidewalk and killed her. There were people there, it was 6.20 in the afternoon. Two of us called 911 and asked other people to put their phones down so we didn't overwhelm the system. The system. Um, the truth is 911 did not answer. We eventually had a fire department person come by accident, I think. 
He didn't have any medical training. He got help. Once the police got there, they were very professional. She was long dead. 911, unfortunately, this was not a one-time event. I've heard from many people since that it does not function. That is not acceptable. Fixing 911 will not solve all the other problems, including response time. But at least if we fix 911, we'll have the data and we'll know where we have to put our resources. So, I'll, I'll, uh, Commissioner Maps, did you have a comment on this? Sure. Um, I'll jump in. Um, Commissioner Gonzalez is, um, is un un unavailable today uh, because he's about to uh, hop on a plane. Um, he's the current commissioner in charge of 911, um, although I had that responsibility in the recent past. Um, and, uh, and so I'm not the, the most equipped to, to speak to this. However, um, it's a space I watch closely. And I want to tell you, uh, I'm, I'm very encouraged at some of the progress we've made. Um, under Commissioner Gonzalez's leadership, I've seen us uh, increase staffing, which is one of the challenges there, is that, that that bureau was understaffed dramatically. And thanks to the support from this council over the last couple of years, we've been able to right size it. Um, I believe this month, to one of the other, I think, um, Original sins with 911 is that they uh, both take they take 911 calls, which are emergency sort of life and death calls, and they take our non-emergency calls, sort of like uh, cold case stuff too. Um, I very much believe that we got to get the people who actually pick up the phones out of the business of uh, picking up non-emergency calls, uh, Commissioner. It's although it's been little noted, um, I believe at this moment the bureau um, is currently implementing artificial intelligence to answer the um, non-emergency calls. You can basically, the, the way it tends to work over there is we get about a half a million 911 calls a year and half a million uh, non-emergency calls. Now, if the non-emergency AI works the way we hope it'll work, uh, we should get dramatically more um, effective um, in picking up these calls in a timely fashion. Uh, so I share your concern here. Um, not every problem in the city has um, um, an imminent solution, but I believe, um, uh, thanks to some of the good work being done by uh, Director Kazi and uh, Commissioner Gonzalez, we're actually making progress on this one. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you, and I'll, I'll just add to this. Um, when uh, I took office, I, I was surprised that we did not have a fully functional non-emergency phone system. And I believe we were probably one of the last major cities in America to have one. And I just want to second what Commissioner Maps just said. We, we've all, at some point, uh, had responsibility over that system. It's currently Commissioner Gonzalez, who's the commissioner in charge. We have repeatedly increased funding, increased funding for training, increased funding to hire new personnel, increased funding for overtime, uh, made significant new investments in technology to modernize the system. Uh, significant new investments in 311, as well as advertising and communications to get people to not call 911 for non-emergency calls, but to call other numbers. Uh, we're not where we need to be. But we have, we have laid the foundation for the building we want to build. And I have great confidence that we're all in alignment on this issue. We don't always agree on everything. On this one, we do agree. We see the importance of it. And I want to thank you, um, since you're here, uh, for your past leadership. We are the inheritors of a lot of the good work that you did while you were here. And I want to acknowledge that. So thanks, <coughs> Commissioner well, I appreciate Ryan. it. May I make one Yeah, please, comment? of course. You bet. I'm sure everybody is trying, and I'm sure you have devoted more resources. This has been a problem for several years. I've heard from so many people since this incident was reported. 911 does not function. We may be in process of improving it. 911 should answer within three rings every time. And we have an emergency now. People are giving up. Even if there's going to be a solution with artificial intelligence or whatever, yes, you need training. Have law students answer the phone in the meantime. So uh, I'll just respond to that. Um, our nation has never experienced a labor shortage like we have today. And for the first time in my life, 
we don't have a line of people even wanting to be firefighters. Do you remember how, peop how competitive that used to be? Um, we're, we're just in a different time when it comes to labor. So we, this council has allocated the funding for positions. Um, as you know, there's an extensive training period. It's like being a police officer, except it's a different profession that requires a lot of training before you're, you're good to go. Um, so I, I feel like we're doing everything we can and approaching this with a sense of urgency that it deserves. But the, the reality is uh, this is work that should have been done a decade or two ago. And but, we're, but we we're, are we're where we are. Uh, I'm not saying that law students were going to permanently solve the problem. But in the interim, until we get there, let's, you know, law students can be trained very quickly sure. to at least do triage. Let's get the right number of phone numbers and volunteers from the law school or other colleges and get this thing answered because the city is losing the capacity to have citizens feel like they can get through. Yeah, that, and, and, that, and that's, that is that's a an serious interesting, problem. Interesting. They have to be certified, though, don't they? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, the, what I would add to this, con I would add two things to this conversation. Um, I think people have a misconception about um, what our 911 call takers uh, do. A lot of folks think of them as kind of working in a call center, uh, which really misunderstands um, the nature of their work. I think their work is much closer to being an air traffic controller where they're getting in lots of information about a, a crisis. Uh, they're taking a look at the resources that we have on the ground and you know, even though you have a fire station, it doesn't necessarily mean you have a fire truck right there. Um, so it's very, com very complex work. It takes 18 months to train them. Uh, so you know, our 911 operators are recognized as first responders by this council um, and like every first responder in our system, it takes about 18 months to bring them um, up to speed. I am really hopeful uh, here. Uh, um, it's unfortunate that Commissioner Gonzalez is not um, online because something um, and I don't know how this experiment has turned out, turned out, but I believe at this point we have turned on our artificial intelligence 24 hours a day uh, to answer our 911 calls, which frankly should make us 50% more efficient. You know, we're probably about into hour 100 of this current experiment, so I don't know, and I haven't gotten a brief on, on how it works, but it, I believe and I'm hopeful that this moment that we're in right now represents um, a pivotal turning point in uh, how quickly we're able to get aid to where people, um, aid to people in need. Uh, well, thank well, you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you. Last, last thing, I apologize for taking more of your time, but I don't claim that fixing 911 would get the resources out to people. It won't. But if we don't at least have 911 functioning, we don't even have the data. And it doesn't take 18 months to train somebody to be a triage responder. Law students could do it in the interim. It's not a perfect solution, but let's not have the perfect be the enemy of the good. We need to have this fixed thank right you. away. Commissioner Ryan. Yeah, first, uh, thank you colleagues who are closer to it for answering all the questions. I just missed some important details. What was the date and time of the incident? It was July 15th, Saturday at 6.19 p.m. At 6 I know that because I called 911 at 6.20. Okay. And there were people there. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you for being here. Appreciate it. All right, that completes communications. First time certain item is item number 826, a proclamation. Proclaim October 2023 to be Breast Cancer Awareness Month. Colleagues, our next item is a proclamation naming October to be Breast Cancer Awareness Month. I'd like to welcome Susan Stearns, who's the CEO of the Pink Lemonade Project, to present this year's proclamation. Welcome. Thank you for being here. Hi. It's good to see you. Uh, Mr. Wheeler, uh, Mayor Wheeler, excuse me, uh, City Council. First of all, just um, thank you for the opportunity to present today. Um, I want to say the last time we were together, it was in a virtual format. So just I appreciate 3D government in action, and thank you for um, having us today. Um, October is Breast Cancer Awareness Month. I've got to confess, I don't have a copy of the proclamation. I thought you were reading it. So I am happy to say a few words, but if you've got it. I've got it. Okay. Um, 
I can read or you can read it. Typically, the mayors read it. Okay. <laughs> do you want to read it did, first? Did up? you want to say more, and and, uh, and then I'll let my colleagues speak, and then Perfect. we can read okay, the Okay, let's do that. All right. I, I do a lot of these, and sure. typically, the mayors read them, and then I get a few minutes. So first time live in Portland. So again, I'm Susan Stern, CEO of Pink Lemonade Project. We are a Vancouver-based nonprofit uh, that was founded 14 years ago by doctors Allen and Cassie Gabriel. Uh, two Vancouver-based physicians who s treated a lot of women um, affected by breast cancer and saw the gaps in Southwest Washington of support services. Um, today, Pink Lemonade Project serves all of Oregon and Southwest Washington. In the th last three years, we have uh, tripled the size of our organization and nearly tripled the number of people served across the extended um, uh, two-state region. Um, today, our organization uh, provides the full continuum of care from uh, breast health education and awareness, screening, early prevention, and then at the point of diagnosis, we help people with a full spectrum of emotional, psychological, and financial supports. We know um, uh, data uh, tells us that during the pandemic, um, there was an 80 to 90 percent drop in breast cancer mammograms and screenings in 2020, and today we are looking at an increased rate of later stage diagnoses needing more aggressive treatments and ultimately at a projected wave of breast cancer related deaths because of the pandemic. Um, as a community-based organization, we work with all the healthcare systems across the two-state region to make sure that breast cancer patients get the emotional, psychological, and financial supports that they need. Um, we um, also know that, um, unfortunately, as I say, uh, COVID has set the disease back, but in particular, um, before the pandemic as well as now, unfortunately, all the di health disparities um, statistics play out in breast cancers as well. And while white women have the great greatest incidence of breast cancer, uh, more people of color die of this disease than my, my fellow counterparts. So um, we are committed as an organization, as a board, and as a community partner to doing better to improve the health equity for this disease. And today our mission is to educate and empower um, uh, and support all communities, whoops, lost my mic, um, all communities affected by breast cancer and we're working with more BIPOC communities across the entire two-state region to make sure that we make a difference um, and help people, more people of color affected by this disease. Uh, last thing, I just wanna say that uh, during my own treatment, I used to make the comment that breast cancer picked the wrong family. Um, I was greatly fortunate and uh, when I was diagnosed five and a half years ago, I had a strong family and a support network to help me get through my treatment and where I am today. And my comment today is, uh, that I say to all the cities is I really want to elevate that to say that uh, uh, cancer picked the wrong community. So we work with uh, your public health department. We are working more with the federally qualified health systems. We're working more with community-based organizations, Urban League, NAACP, NARA, um, OCDC, Northwest Family Services, and so many others across the um, Portland Vancouver. Vancouver metro area and beyond to help make a difference for all affected by breast cancer. And it really does take a village to make a difference in this disease. So thank you for the recognition and thank you for uh, uh, recognizing Breast Cancer Awareness Month. Thank you, Susan. Before I read the proclamation, I'll, we'll hear a couple of comments from my colleagues, Commissioner Ryan and then Commissioner Maps. Oh, my hand was up from the last time, but that's fine because I do have a couple of oh. questions. Um, <laughs> Sorry about that. Um, Commissioner Maps will give all the details in the history. It's always really wonderful to listen to. Um, <laughs> I just set you up, uh, <laughs> but you always do that. My question is, you talked about the disparities, and it seems like it's early detection disparities is what you're I, saying. It, it's on many levels. So um, insurance rate makes a difference. Um, uh, those who that's all uh, get screened yeah. makes uh, will um, make a difference, but um, uh, also, Right now, the trend is for more younger women to get diagnosed, and with the younger diagnoses, it is more younger women of color, and the cancers, the type of breast cancer getting diagnosed in the younger women is a more aggressive type of cancer than for people that are getting diagnosed in That's older ages. That's the trend that it's hitting a yeah, younger Yeah, the trend age. is younger right now. Um, unfortunately, it's going in the wrong direction. 
we have the right partners, so I want to congratulate you and thank you for reaching out and working with the nonprofit culture specific partners. That will help quite a bit. But um, anyway, I just want to make sure I learned all I could from you about about okay. this. Now, it affects men at a very low level, so like 1%. Uh, 1% 1, 1 of men get breast cancer, um, so it, it's not just a women's disease. Um, and I will say that um, you know we work with the trans and uh, queer community, and gender is fluid in the Pacific Northwest, and so it's um, there are all types of people who are getting breast cancer. Um, whether or not they um, stand by a binary or non-binary definition of gender. Oh, that's helpful too. Okay, just a couple of questions, thanks. Thank you, Commissioner. Commissioner Mapps. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, colleagues, I, I wanna begin by thanking Susan for being here today and uh, sharing those powerful comments. And I want to also say this. Um, colleagues, I'm honored to join you in proclaiming October 2023 to be Breast Cancer Awareness Month here in Portland, Oregon. During Breast Cancer Awareness Month, we stand with those who have been diagnosed with this dreaded disease, and we honor those who have lost their battle with breast cancer. We reaffirm our commitment to raising awareness of this disease, and we applaud the advocates, the medical professionals, the researchers, and the caregivers who dedicate their lives to caring for the sick. Finally, um, during Breast Cancer Awareness Month, we reaffirm our commitment to finding better treatments and ultimately a cure for breast cancer. Now, as we all know, breast cancer has touched the lives of thousands of Portlanders, including my own. In the time that I have served on this council, my own mother died of breast cancer. Um, obviously, without her, I would not be here today. I miss her every day, and I am not alone. By the end of this year, more than 280,000 women in the United States are likely to be diagnosed with breast cancer. And this year, more than 42,000 women in the United States are likely to die from that dreaded disease. However, there is good news. 90% of women diagnosed with breast cancer today will survive for the next five years. But the key to survival, as we have heard, is early detection. Regular breast cancer screenings are the most reliable way to detect breast cancer early. And that's why I encourage citizens, government agencies, private businesses, nonprofit organizations, and other interested groups to engage in activities that increase awareness of what we can do to prevent, treat, and find a cure for breast cancer. So thank you very much, Mr. Mayor, and I'll hand the floor back to you. Thank you. Susan, we're, all three of us are, are really very, very pleased that you're here today. And we want to thank the Pink Lemonade Project for all the work you do organizing, advocating, bringing people together, supporting people. Uh, it's just a really terrific uh, project. And uh, I know you do work not only here in our great city, but indeed throughout Oregon as well as Southwest Washington. And so there's a lot of people who are very appreciative of what you are doing. Today, as we mark October as Breast Cancer Awareness Month, as my colleagues indicated, this is an opportunity for us to reflect on every life that has been touched by this disease. And uh, I think we can all agree it's had a, a profound impact on our community. But it's also uplifting to hear you and others who are uh, in the breach, if you will, supporting people who are impacted and letting people know that there is hope. With that, I will read the proclamation. Whereas October is nationally recognized as Breast Cancer Awareness Month and aims to raise awareness and educate about breast health and breast cancer, which is the leading cause of death in women in the United States. This month also recognizes the many survivors, those living with metastatic breast cancer, their supporters and loved ones, and it honors those lives lost to this disease. And whereas, in the Pacific Northwest, one in seven women are affected by breast cancer when the national average is one in eight women, and breast cancer also affects 
1% of men. Only 15% of diagnoses are related to family history. 20 to 30% of those diagnosed with early disease will experience a recurrence. And whereas there are still too many health disparities among underserved communities by income, geography, insurance, ethnicity, age, and gender, who are disproportionately impacted by this disease. And whereas Pink Lemonade Project, a Washington-based nonprofit organization, is on a mission to educate, empower, and support all communities affected by breast cancer with vital outreach, education, screening, financial assistance, support groups, and mentors, and books across Oregon and Southwest Washington. And whereas, Breast Cancer Awareness Month is an opportunity to unite the community and spread important messages of early detection, screening and prevention, and assistance to women and men before, during, and after a diagnosis to increase health equity, reduce the number of new diagnoses, to increase survivorship, and to improve everyone's quality of life. Now, therefore, I, Ted Wheeler, the mayor of the city of Portland, Oregon, the city of Roses, do hereby proclaim October 2023 to be Breast Cancer Awareness Month in Portland and encourage all residents to observe this month. Thank you, Susan, so Thank much you for all much. you do. Thanks Appreciate for having it. me today. Thank you. And next uh, item, also a time certain, and we're good, right? We're good on the time, 827 to proclaim 20, October of 2023 to be Filipino American History Month. Oops, I'm doing your job, Keelan. You do, you do you. 827, please, a proclamation. Thank you, Mayor. Proclaim October 2023 to be Filipino American History Month. Good morning, everyone. Our next item proclaims October 2023 to be Filipino American History Month. This morning, we have a distinguished group of presenters coming before the City Council. Our presenters are Jamie Lim, who's the president of the Filipino American National Historical Society, the Oregon chapter and publisher of The Asian Reporter, Jan Mason, President, Philippine American Chamber of Commerce of Oregon and Senior Marketing Associate with McKenzie Incorporated. Enrico Tadeo, Honorary Consul for the Philippines. Irene Appel, Small Business Technical Assistance Special Specialist with the Port of Portland. Welcome to all of you. It is so great to see you here in person. We're honored by your presence. Thank you for being here. Good morning, Mr. Mayor. Morning, sir. Commissioner Maps, Commissioner Ryan, morning to you. Thank you for having us this morning. Um, you know, um, many of the first Filipinos that arrived in the United States came here in 1587, many, many years ago. and. Uh, part of the uh, Manila-Mexico galleon trade. So that's uh, when California was still Mexico. Um, more, more Filipinos came, second wave after the Second World War, uh, arrived in the United States when many of the Philippine military was merged into the United States Armed Forces. Many of us also volunteered for the U.S. Armed Services, me included. I served in the United States Coast Guard during the Vietnam conflict. The fourth wave of Filipino immigrants came in 1965. A very large number of Filipinos came to the U.S. after President Lyndon Johnson signed the immigration bill in 1965 that allowed for more immigration. Over the past 50 years, the share of immigrants from the Philippines has grown modestly from just over 1% in 1960 to more than 4% in 2020. 
Filipinos now represent the fourth largest immigrant group in the U.S. by country of origin behind Mexico, China, and India. As a group, immigrants from the Philippines are better educated, more likely to have strong English language skills, more likely to be naturalized U.S. citizens, and less likely to enter the United States as refugees or asylum seekers. Notable, of course, is the very presence of the number of Filipinos working within the city of Portland and City Hall. They're doing a great job for you guys. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Mia Miller. Yeah. Good morning, Mayor Wheeler, morning. Commissioner Maps, Commissioner Ryan. Today on October 3rd, I'm deeply uh, proud to represent the Philippine American Chamber of Commerce of Oregon, or known as PACO. I'm here to celebrate with you all the Philippine American heritage and our long history of living the Bayanian spirit, a Filipino word that expresses how we approach living a spirit of communal unity and cooperation. In my own words, I translated it this way with one question, how can I be your hero today? In the spirit of communal unity and cooperation, we share our vision, mission, and unwavering commitment to building a more robust and inclusive economy for all through economic resiliency, sustainability, and global trade and commerce. As a president and interim executive director of PACO, I'm humbled to lead this mission-driven economic business organization. PACO is more, just, more than just an acronym. It symbolizes hope, empowerment, and positive change in our diverse community. We are a collective of visionary business entrepreneurs, dedicated professionals, volunteers, and loyal supporters from both the public and private sectors. We face significant challenges in advancing our goals, particularly the re activities related to upward wealth mobility. Our chamber operates with limited funding and staff, making it difficult to implement mission-aligned initiatives. However, we appreciate particularly during the pandemic that you, Mayor Wheeler, led a budget priority to support minority chambers to receive capacity building funds. Thank you for recognizing this challenge. Filipinos are humble and modest community who give, who have assimilated into American society. While part of the largest Asian diaspora in the United States, Filipinos are often overlooked. But we encounter these challenges with our resiliency and uh, Bayanian spirit. We still ask ourselves, how can I be your hero today? Together, we are shaping this destiny of small and medium-sized businesses and nurturing the dreams of budding entrepreneurs. Our impact is profound, and we invite all who share our vision to join us in making Portland a thriving, equitable economy. We do more than serve clients. We build bridges of understanding and opportunity. Each individual is not just a statistic. They are everyday heroes, restaurant owners, media publishers, accountants, doctors, nurses, grocery clerks, construction professionals, architects, engineers, a rising skilled workforce, and students who, with PACO's encouragement and leadership, are convinced that we can overcome obstacles and contribute to an inclusive economy. Celebrate with me by asking yourself, how can I be your hero today? Visit our Filipino restaurants. Thank our workforce talent who work to be a hero every day and support our minority chambers like PACO. In doing so, you too will be living the Bayanian spirit and uplifting the Filipino-American heritage, history, and with resiliency and endurance. Thank you. Thank you. Welcome. Thanks for being here. Yes, Honorable Bayer, uh, Commissioners, uh, appreciate being here. This is, this is quite a privilege to be here in, uh, in this hallowed hall and uh, uh, with, with the people who lead the city in the way that you're doing. Uh, my name is Enrico Tadeo. I'm the honorary consul for the Philippines. And there's a Portland Post. Uh, it's, it's officially declared that there's a Portland Post for the Philippines um, as a regular consulate. Um, so I'm, I have the honor to send greetings and extend my greetings from, from the Philippines. Warm, well, it's always warm. Greetings from the Philippines will always be warm. Maybe even hot sometimes, <laughs> but send, send greetings from the 7,000 plus islands, from the one, um, what is it, 113 million people 
from the government and the people of the Philippines because there's a special relationship between the United States, between Americans and the Filipinos that has come, you know, as uh, Mr. Lim uh, uh, um, uh, implied, it, it's, it's been since even, what, the 1500s or so, but uh, the, the, the uh, deep relationship probably started when the uh, colonizers, uh, when, when the Spanish colonizers left the Philippines in about 1898 and, uh, and the United States the Americans came in in 1898. Um, uh, so none of us were born yet at that time, mm -hmm. but, but at that time, uh, the President of the United States actually declared it a, uh, what was it, a, um, well, it, it escapes me now, a destiny, a, uh, there's a term that he used, but anyway, he, he said, this is manifest destiny, manifest destiny that uh, this should happen, that the, that the Americans will be in the Philippines, and it did happen for the next half a century. Um, not everybody was necessarily um, uh, happy with that, but as it turned out, you know, the end of that half a century uh, time frame, the Filipinos and Americans fought side by side in World War II. And that, uh, that again, uh, deepened the relationship between the two countries. And even beyond that, after independence was actually given in uh, uh, 1945, even beyond that, I think the relationship continued to deepen because we continued to work side by side in many different ways, as explained by uh, uh, Ms. Mason here, that uh, we, we work together for, for, for a common, common objectives. We work together in, to, to build the economy. We work together to build a social milieu that actually uh, we share um, uh, as we live together like we, are, well, like we do in Portland right now. So I appreciate the fact of the recognition of the Filipinos, especially those who are in the, in the United States right now in the Portland area, that, that we are one in working together to make the place a better place to live. And this recognition, it really uh, touches me because we know that uh, even though sometimes we think we're not being recognized, we are. And this recognition, this proclamation tells us that. Thank you very much. Thank you, appreciate it. Good morning. Good morning, Mayor Wheeler, Commissioner Ryan, and Commissioner Maps. My name is Irene Appel, and I am a proud member of the Filipino American community. Not only am I a member of the Filipino community, I am also a board member of the Philippine American Chamber of Commerce of Oregon, or better known as PACO. And I'm also the Port of Portland's Small Business Technical Assistance Specialist. Professional titles aside, I'm a first generation Filipino American. Both of my parents are immigrants. My mother is from the Philippines and my father is Dutch. How did a Filipino immigrant and a <laughs> Dutch immigrant meet in Portland? Uh, your guess is as good as mine. I grew up in Canby, Oregon, so my upbringing was like a very multicultural island surrounded by farmland. Regardless, everything led me to be here today and I'm honored to have the opportunity to share my experience with you in light of this momentous occasion of proclaiming October 2023 as Filipino American History Month in Portland. Growing up in Canby, I made up half of one of like six Asian kids in my school. And I'm fairly certain none of the other five and a half kids were Filipino. Being Filipino, I was definitely a part of the cultural minority in Canby. The largest cultural population in Canby is the Latinx community, which stands at about 17% of the population today, with the API community coming in at just under 2%. So I grew up in my parents' nursery, growing up in a small business owned by immigrants. Let's just say my parents had a very healthy view on their kids helping with the family business. Some might say healthy, others might say questionable, but <laughs> all jokes aside, I had a front row seat to watch my parents navigate the endless obstacles that are unique to small business owners, people of color, and especially women of color. Growing up in a small and fairly conservative town, society taught me that I should hide my differences, like my Filipino heritage, and blend in as much as possible. It was only until I was able to move away from my hometown, a whole 35 minutes away to Portland, that I was able to begin to shake that mindset and be proud of my cultural heritage. 
The greater Filipino American community has since welcomed me with open arms. And when you're in and among the Filipino community, you know that they take community to a whole new level. I've gained at least, new, at least 75 new aunties and uncles just being on the PACO board. <laughs> The Filipino American community isn't just a community. We are truly a family. We are very accepting of, not only are we a family, we are very accepting of people from all different backgrounds. As long as you take a plate of food, eat it all, and leave with some leftovers, you're family too. Through this never ending support from my family and my community, I now manage the Port of Portland's small business technical assistance programs, where we provide comprehensive support services to small business owners, most of whom are also from communities of color, at no cost to them, in order to help them navigate the same issues that I watched my parents face growing up. I've also pr provided the amazing opportunity to serve on PACO's board of directors. I'm very blessed to be able to use my lived and professional experience to further the Port of Portland's mission to, of shared prosperity in our region and PACO's mission of building generational wealth to empower economic resiliency, affordable sustainability, and purpose-driven global commerce, especially for socially mar marginalized and economically disadvantaged communities. All of this in short, I am truly proud to be Filipino American. Mabuhay. Thank you. We'll now hear from uh, my colleagues, Commissioner Maps. You've got your hand up first. Sure. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. I, I want to start off by thanking our panel for uh, joining us today. Um, and I also want to say this. Um, colleagues, I am delighted to join you in proclaiming October 2023 to be Filipino American History Month here in Portland, Oregon. Filipino Americans are an essential part of Portland's culture, economy, and history. And Filipino American History Month honors that legacy. Um, Filipino American History Month is celebrated in October, as we've heard, to commemorate October 18th, 1587. That is the day when the first Filipinos arrived in North America at a place now known as Morro Bay, California. October 18th, uh, 1587 is also a reminder that the history between the Philippines and these United States is long, complicated, occasionally tragic, and always triumphant. For example, the first permanent Filipino settlement in what we now think of as the United States was founded in 1763 in St. Marlowe Parish, Louisiana. And in 1898, the United States purchased the Philippines from Spain for $20 million. Perhaps unsurprisingly, the very next year, 1899, the Filipino people launched an insurrection against their American landlords. That conflict is known as the Philippine-American War. That war lasted three years. Over 4,200 Americans died in that conflict. Over 20,000 Filipinos died in that conflict and more than 200,000 Filipino civilians perished in that conflagration. Now, from 1898 to 1946, the Philippines existed essentially as a colony of the United States. Here in Oregon, the first large wave of Filipinos arrived in the early 1900s. This wave of Filipino immigrants largely consisted of two groups, uh, farm workers and students. For example, in the early 1900s, Filipino farm workers made their way to Oregon after working on farms in California and in Washington. Fish canneries in Alaska and pineapple and sugar plantations in Hawaii. Now, around that same time, let's say 1903, the U.S. territorial government in the Philippines started sponsoring Filipino students to study in the United States, including here in Oregon. That program brought many Filipino students to the University of Oregon and to Oregon State University. Today, uh, more than 4.2 million Filipino Americans live in these United States and 42,000 
Filipino Americans live in the Portland metro area. Colleagues, um, there are many lessons to be learned from this history of Filipinos in America, but one of the most straightforward lessons is this. For more than 400 years, our Filipino friends, family, neighbors, and ancestors help build the nation and city that we have inherited and love. Which is why I encourage all Portlanders to join this council in celebrating Filipino American History Month. Thank you very much, and thank you very much to our panel. Thank you, Commissioner Maps. Commissioner Ryan. Yes, thanks, Mayor, and thank you, Commissioner Professor Maps. That was really eloquent. I just found your presentation to be so beautiful. You, the four of you covered so much ground, so much history. So thank you for taking the time to be here today. Um, I was uh, reflecting on the building of generational wealth that you mentioned and how I always like to lift that any time we tell the story, the real, the real beautiful American story of um, all of our emerging economies always come from immigrants. And so we should always welcome um, immigration and build those economies because that's what's made our country prosperous and unique and, and uh, sticks out. Um, one of the best things that's happened to my family is my fourth oldest brother married a Hawaiian Filipino. I think there's a lot of that, especially if they're from Hawaii. And when you said gained, all I thought about was how much weight I gain when I, <laughs> when I am with them for like over a few days. And every holiday is when we, we co-host and I always lean on her to um, help out with cooking because it's just so much better than if I just provided the food. So anyway, I'm hungry now and um, <laughs> it's early, but I just want to thank you all so much for being here. It's, it was really a blessing. Thanks. Thank you all. With that, I will read the proclamation. Whereas October 2023 is the 436th anniversary of the earliest documented proof of Filipino presence on the shores of the west coast of the continental United States, and whereas the citizens of Oregon should be informed of the positive impact Filipino Americans have had on our communities, and whereas in Oregon, thousands of Filipino Americans have made contributions to the fields of teaching, business, government, agriculture, ministry, medicine, and other sciences, humanities, and of course the United States Armed Forces. And whereas, it's imperative for Filipino American youth to have positive role models instill in them the importance of education, comp complemented with the richness of their ethnicity and the values of their legacy. And whereas, efforts must continue to promote the study of Filipino American history and culture because the role of Filipino Americans and those of other people have been overlooked in the writing, teaching, and learning of United States history. And whereas, this anniversary is a significant time to study the advancement of Filipino Americans, a time of celebration, remembrance, reflection, and motivation and a relevant time for all of our citizens to learn and appreciate more about Filipino Americans and their historic contributions to our nation and to the state of Oregon. Now, therefore, I, Ted Wheeler, mayor of the city of Portland, the city of Roses, do hereby proclaim October 2023 to be Filipino American History Month in Portland and encourage all residents to join in recognition of the positive impact Filipino Americans have had on our community. Thank you all. Thank you, Mr. Lentz, good to see you. Thank you for an excellent presentation, appreciate it. Uh, would you like a photo? Yes, please. Let's do that, good. All right, good. Yes, please. You looked ready to go, so. You just stay there, and then no, no, we'll come down. Oh, you
All right, next item is item number 828, a resolution. Appoint Mike Walsh to the Citizen Review Committee for a term to expire October 1st, 2026. Colleagues, before us today is a request to appoint a new member of the Citizen Review Committee. Here to present is Ross Caldwell, IPR Director, along with Candace Avalos and Ume Delegato, the current CRC Chair and Vice Chair. Welcome to all. It's good to see you. Thank you very much. Uh, good morning, Mayor and Commissioners. My name is Ross Caldwell. I'm the director at IPR. Uh, today, I'm here to ask you to consider the appointment of Mike Walsh to the Citizen Review Committee. As you all know, the 11-member Citizen Review Committee has an important role in our current police oversight system. The committee is comprised of volunteers who are representative of our, of our community and help to improve police accountability. They are responsible for ensuring impartial hearings of appeals, developing policy recommendations to IPR, council, police commissioner, the chief, and to provide an advisory role to IPR and PPB's internal affairs. And now I'd like to introduce the CRC chair and vice chair, Candace Avalos and Yume Delegato, and they're gonna have a few words to say about Mike. Thank you. Thank you. Hello, good morning. I'm Candace Avalos, she, her pronouns. I'm the current chair of the Citizen Review Committee and I'm here to speak in support of Mike Walsh's appointment. Um, the CRC is in a moment of transition right now and we really feel that Mike is the best fit for this moment. Um, I personally first met Mike when I worked at PSU and he was in the Dean of Students office uh, and my first impressions are that he really cared about the community and he cared about improving the systems and people around him which is why he's such a great fit for this position now. Uh, since 2020, our work came under a spotlight, as you know, um, and many came in to help, including you, May, um, and also Mike, uh, who were volunteer members of the Crowd Control and Use of Force Work Group, but they um, really dug in deep into the work and reached out to help uh, Mike, in particular, he really brought his expertise in conduct and interpersonal relationships and also research, which has been to our great advantage having him on um, as a volunteer member and why we really want him to be a full member. Um, he's kind, he's relatable, he deeply cares for our community. Uh, his greatest power has been editing our very complex 40-some page reports. Uh, you already got one from us a couple years ago and we have another one that we're gonna approve tonight at our CRC meeting. Um, this one that we worked on is kind of a timestamp of um, CRC's work over our 22 year history in preparation for the new system, um, leaving behind resources and wisdom to inform the next chapter of police oversight. So when you see that report and you see how professional and polished it is, you have Mike to thank who um, spent all weekend working on that and we're really grateful for his leadership and his service. Um, so. Lastly, I'll just say that um, tonight's actually also gonna be my last meeting. I'm stepping down after six years of service. I'm very grateful, and this is also why I wanted to make sure to be here and speak for Mike, because I think he's a really great um, addition to the next chapter of this ERC as we transition into the new system. Um, kind of leaving this report is one of my, my final acts of service, and I hope that you all can help me in the final, final act, which is appointing Mike uh, to the CRC. So I urge you to vote yes. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Candace. Uh, you may Delgado, he, him. I'm the current vice chair of the Citizen Review Committee, and I guess as of tomorrow, I will be the acting chair. Um, I just wanted to echo what Candace said in support of uh, Mike Walsh's nomination. Um, Mike has a uh, very qualified track record to hear complaints as a former dean of students and as the current provost of uh, OHSU. Um, but in addition to that, as Candace noted, Mike has been a really um, diligent and capable volunteer for the CRC. So as, as you may know, the CRC has volunteer panels or um, subcommittees that uh, community volunteers can serve on without having been appointed to the CRC. And Mike has been in that role uh, since 2020. And as Candace noted, he's been a really invaluable um, assistant in, in that process, especially with editing documents, doing research, et cetera. So not only do you have before you a nomination of someone who uh, is extremely capable of soberly, carefully looking at uh, appeals and allegations of officer misconduct, but you have someone who is a really dedicated volunteer and uh, we are going to need that, uh, we're gonna need Mike's energy and his diligence um, in this next phase for CRC. Uh, as Candace noted, we have 
this is one uh, vacancy that are, we are filling. We have three more to fill in the coming months, and so we will need council's uh, assistance and patience with us as we get those nominations before you. So um, thank you for having us today, and uh, we encourage you to vote for Mike's nomination. Thanks, you, Mike. Mike, did you want to say a few That's things? Just a few words. Thanks, sure. Mayor Wheeler and Commissioner Maps, Commissioner Ryan, thanks so much for having me here. I'm Mike Walsh. He is in pronouns. And um, I have been very interested in police oversight and civic engagement all my life. Um, and I've been a Portland resident since 2001. And I've, um, since uh, when my kids were growing up, I didn't have a lot of time to um, engage civically as I have been the last few years, but then they moved out. And I have. <laughs> Congratulations. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, yep, exactly. Now I have more. I have more time, and so about three years ago, I reached out to Candace, uh, again, who we you know met each other at PSU. I was dean of students there at the time, uh, and just asked if there's a way that I could get involved, um, especially in uh, police oversight, civilian oversight, and that kind of thing. And so, uh, suggested uh, Candace suggested I join the the work group, and so I did, and really have enjoyed it, and done a lot of work to uh, you know doing a lot of editing, but also I've done a lot of learning. And over those three years, realized this is really the kind of civic engagement I hope to uh, be a part of. And it's really in line with the kind of work I've done all my life as well. So anyway, I do appreciate you considering my nomination. And I, you know, of course, I hope you will vote to approve. So thank you for hearing. Great. And I, I know we have public testimony in a minute. But, but while I've got you here, I, I want to thank you all. Um, I, I know that this has been a, a time of great transition. Ross, I, I want to appreciate you and the whole team at IPR. I know this has been a very, very challenging transition, and you've handled it honestly masterfully. Thank and you. and I want to acknowledge uh, that that's, that's been a big, big burden to you and your team, and I want to thank you for that leadership. Thank you so much. And Candace, uh, thank you for your many, many years of service, and uh, we look forward to seeing what's next. And you may, um, as I committed, I think it was our not our last meeting, but maybe the meeting prior to that. Uh, this council wants to support you in your new role as the burden of leadership falls on your shoulders. So there, <laughs> there will be challenges ahead. And I want you to know that, that I stand here and this council stands here ready to assist you in any way that we can. That's a commitment I made to you and it's a commitment I, I intend to uphold. And then Mike, uh, again, congratulations on successful launches. <laughs> and thank you. <laughs> uh, thank you for stepping forward. Colleagues, any comments before we get to public testimony? No. Uh, we have two people signed up. First up, Dan Handelman is online. Good morning, Dan. Uh, good morning, Mayor, City Council members. Can you hear me all right? Yep, loud and clear. Uh, this is Dan Handelman. I use he, him pronouns. I'm with the group Portland Cop Watch. Uh, Portland Cop Watch has no objection to the appointment of Mike Walsh to the Citizen Review Committee. In fact, Mr. Walsh is an ideal kind of candidate because, as you've heard, he has spent time over the last three years as a community volunteer attending CRC meetings and actively participating in CRC's work groups. Indeed, this is also how Vice Chair Yumi Delgado became acquainted with CRC before joining as a full member. The occasion of Mr. Walsh's appointment gives the city and we in the community some time to reflect on the valuable work of CRC members. For instance, they are still capable of hearing appeals on misconduct cases where the complainant is not satisfied with the initial decision made most often by the officer's supervisor. In cases where the CRC proposes a new finding and the Bureau disagrees, appeals come to city council for a vote. The last time this happened in 2021, council voted to find misconduct by an officer who failed to file a stolen car report for someone who then lost their car when it was towed after having been recovered. We've never seen what kind of corrective action was taken based on council's decision. CRC members also participate in force and deadly force hearings by the police review board. Unlike the CRC, the PRB holds its meetings behind closed doors. The CRC members are only allowed to talk broadly about the process of those hearings, even though deadly force cases are of the greatest importance to those looking at police misconduct issues. The PRB public reports that have come out so far covering cases heard in the last two years have only included four of the 17 deadly force incidents from 2021 to 2022. We wonder how long it will take for a review board to deliberate on whether Officer Christopher Sathoff violated policy when he shot and killed Emmanuel Clark Johnson last November. It took the grand jury nine months to deliberate. And it was only last past Friday we learned that Sathoff 
shot the unarmed young black man in the back due to a case of mistaken identity. The CRC has the opportunity to host the police review board at a public hearing once every six months when the reports come out in order to discuss them, if only to talk about the process and the policy recommendations, but they've never done so. There are normally 11 members of CRC and at least 15 people who rotate onto the police review board, so there are 26 community members theoretically representing the interests of the other 630,000 of us on these cases. There should be more public connection from these uh, folks who are monitoring the police. And I'll turn it over to my colleague, Mark Porras. Thank you. Next up, we have Mark Porras. Uh, can you hear me? Yes, loud and clear. Great. Good morning, Mayor and Commissioners. My name is Mark Porras. I use he, him pronouns, and I'm with the group Portland Cop Watch. Uh, lately, most of CRC's work is focused on the upcoming transition from the current oversight system to the new one, outlined in Charter Section 2-10 and given details by the Police Accountability Commission. Uh, we understand the CRC will be presenting their two reports on their past and future to City Council sometime soon. And along those lines, in terms of transparency, uh, the CRC chair asked Independent Police Review Director Ross Caldwell last month if he'd present the IPR's annual report at tonight's CRC meeting. And Director Caldwell said he'd have to check into that, and it is not currently on the agenda. Uh, we're looking forward to the day when the community board can ask the director of the oversight agency to do something, and they'll be more responsive, especially with a document as important as the annual report. Um, notably, uh, although CRC engaged in many activities last year, they're not even mentioned in the IPR's 2022 report, which was published at the end of August. And we just now learned that Chair Avalos is also stepping down. Um, so we're looking forward to seeing Council fill her seat as well. And notably, CRC has less of a problem with meeting quorum than PSEP because City Code sets their quorum for uh, the 11 member board at five people. As the new oversight system transition begins, Portland Cop Watch wants to emphasize a few things about the Police Accountability Commission's plan. Over the years, as we um, talk to people who want to file complaints about police, when we explain to them that if their complaint is investigated, there's a 90% chance the investigation will be done by police internal affairs, uh, they usually let out a frustrated sigh. We've also tried to dispel rumors that IPR's aid investigators are all former police officers. Uh, for many years, they had no former officers at IPR, but in recent years, just one investigator was a retired PPB cop, and that one person's presence on staff was enough for incorrect information to go out to the community. One of the biggest barriers to police to uh, people trusting the current system is that they don't think police should be investigating other police. And so we hope uh, Council keeps that in mind as you prepare to send the Police Accountability Commission's package in its entirety to the United States Department of Justice for revisions to the settlement agreement. And when Council votes to adopt the code after that process ends, uh, we greatly appreciate Mr. Walsh's clearly demonstrated commitment to the CRC. And we also appreciate Council's consideration of his appointment. Thank you. Thank you. And does that complete that public testimony? Very good. Colleagues, any further discussion? Please call the roll on the resolution. Maps. Um, I want to thank Mr. Walsh for agreeing to serve on this important committee, and I also want to take a, take a moment to thank Ms. Avalos for her service on this uh, vital group. I vote aye. Ryan. Yeah, uh, that was the most welcoming, warm, enthusiastic um, nomination I've ever, I think, experienced since I've been in this role. <laughs> and I, now I know why. You're, you're just like the perfect uh, fit in terms of how much uh, work you've already put into it. Um, Candace, uh, you're so smart to uh, reach out to your former PSU colleague and um, realize the skill sets that you have are so necessary for this group. So anyway, it's, uh, it's really an honor to vote to approve you and thank you for your service, uh, Candace. And I just noted in um, your application that you're the title, uh, the coordinator, you met at, let's see, mediation, I teach about decision making and judicial and other dispute situations. So you just come really tested um, in your role at OHSU and I'm sure previously at PSU. So thank you so much for your service. I vote aye. Thank you. Wheeler. I vote aye. The appointment is approved. Thanks all again for your service. Thank you. Thank you. Next item, please. Thank this you. is a report 829, please. Appoint Kip Silverman, Carrie Driver, Odelia Zuckerman, and Malay Ramos to the Portland Committee on Community Engaged Policing. Colleagues, I'm pleased today to propose the appointment of four new members of the Portland Committee on Community Engaged Policing. Here to present our new member is PSEP's program manager, Dory Grabinski and Sapir Kamal, both from the Community Safety Division. Welcome, both of you. 
Good afternoon, Mayor and Commissioners. For the record, my name is Story Grabinski, and I'm the Project Manager of the Portland Committee on Community Engaged Policing, also known as PSEP. As you know, PSEP is a mayoral committee tasked with ensuring that community voice is represented in the settlement agreement with the Department of Justice. PSEP offers community members a chance to give input on a broad range of issues related to policing and makes recommendations to the mayor and chief of police. PSEP acknowledges the breadth and diversity of opinions that the Portland community has about public safety. PSEP is proud of the work they have done to foster dialogue and build a respectful and inclusive culture. PSEP welcomes any and all perspectives to chime in at a public meeting regularly held on Wednesday evenings at 6 p.m. I am here today to request the confirmation of four new members to the committee. <coughs> Sorry. We request that Odelia Zuckerman and Molly Ramos be appointed to fill PSEP's two reserved youth seats. Kip Silverman and Carrie Driver will fill the two at-large seats. These appointments will bring our membership to 12 out of 13, and we hope to confirm details for our final appointee in the coming weeks. Um, <clears throat> At this time, I'd like to turn it over to our candidates to introduce themselves. Um, I believe maybe three out of four are with us virtually. Um, so could we start with Kip and then go to Carrie? Yeah, hi. Uh, good morning, Mayor Wheeler and morning. Commissioners Maps and Ryan. Um, nice to see you all up there. I wish I could have been there in person. Uh, for everybody else, my name is Kip Silverman, he, him pronouns. I'm a technologist and activist and father to three incredible human beings. Portland has been my home for nearly 25 years, and I've been committed to doing what I can to make it a more livable and equitable city for all. I'm passionate about community, collaboration, and inclusivity. In my professional and personal capacities, I'm known to creatively solve complex problems, working to ensure that all voices are heard, especially voices that are often pushed to the margins. Been actively working on issues of home and houselessness and food security and hunger for over a decade. I remember when then Chief Mike Grease announced the outcome of United States v. City of Portland more than to end, sorry, and more than 10 years out, I am happy to see progress, but understand there's much more work to do. I strongly believe that transparency and accountability are intrinsic in the relationship between government entities and the public. I hope to use my knowledge and experience to work with my fellow PSEP members and Portland's communities to keep everyone engaged and have their voices heard. As we move forward into a new era of Portland city government and representation, it's even more critical we ensure continuity of this process and ideally expand access for community participation and involvement. I am honored and excited to be part of this effort. Thank you. Thank you. And we'll go to Carrie. Thank you, Dory. Good morning. My name is Carrie Driver. I use she, her pronouns. Good morning, Mayor Wheeler and commissioners. Um, I am very pleased to be accepted as part of PSEP. I um, have lived overseas for much of my adult life, just returning two years ago, and I chose Portland, Oregon out of any other city in America, knowing that it's a beautiful, great place. Um, my first two years here have not been as easy. There's been some adjustments and some transitions to get used to um, with teen sons living in a in a any city in America. But um, but I wanted to join PSET because I have a, a professional career of um, community engagement and um, fleshing out uh, very difficult um, differences in stakeholder groups. And um, overseas, I was bringing people to um, engage in the communities there and um, have a better understanding of the challenges that face those communities. Um, and so I think um, uh, PSEP is, is a terrific organization, and I'm very honored to be here today. And I look Excuse forward me. to learning uh, more about uh, the, the challenges and opportunities in Portland and being part of the solution. Thank you. Thank you. And is Odelia with us virtually as well? Yes. 
Yes. Hi. Good morning, everyone. Can everyone hear me okay? Yep, loud and clear. All right, great. Yeah, so my name's Odelia, um, and I am a recent college graduate. I studied philosophy and politics in Los Angeles, but I've been lucky enough to live in Portland since high school, um, where I went to Lincoln High School. Um, and so I'm really, really excited to join PSEP. Um, right now, my work is in youth violence prevention, specifically sexual assault prevention. So I teach healthy relationships, consent and boundaries and anti-oppression work to youth in high schools. Um, but my intention for motivating joining PSEP is related to this work um, of violence prevention and what does thinking about what a future without violence looks like and how can we think about our systems of accountability and harm repair in a way that is successful for the community of Portland. So I'm very excited to join. Thank you. Thank you. And I just want to make sure um, Malay is, is not with us virtually. I know she was uh, trying to connect. OK, um, so we have Malay's bio and statement of intent. And so I'm going to pass it to my colleague, Samir, to read those for us. Hi, for the record, Samir Canal, Advisory Boards and Commissions Manager for the Community Safety, Safety Division, uh, Molly's bio. Uh, Molly Ramos is dedicated to creating safer schools and communities through policy work. Having successfully championed Measure 114, she understands the importance of effective policies for community safety. With three years of active involvement in community work, she developed a strong sense of agency. Raised in Portland after leaving South Washington, she lived through and witnessed the challenges our community faces and is committed to addressing them. In addition to her work on Measure 114, she's deeply committed in two nonprofit organizations, Love is Stronger and Unite Oregon, focused on youth leadership development and gang violence prevention. Through these roles, she's gained valuable insights into the root causes of community violence and has actively worked to implement programs that provide mentorship, support, and opportunities for at-risk youth. Her experience in these nonprofits has further fueled her passion for creating a safe space for community members to voice their concerns and collaborate towards a safer future. Thank you. Thank you. Do we have public testimony on this item? We have two people signed up. All right, let's go. Uh, first up, we have Dan Handelman. Uh, good morning again, Mayor Wheeler and Commissioners. I hope you can still hear me. Yep. Yeah. Yes? No? Yes. Can you hear me? Oh, okay, great, there he uh, Yes, uh, this is Dan Handelman again, he, him pronouns, Portland Cop Watch. Um, just a few weeks ago on August 30, City Council reappointed four members of the PCCEP. We noted as usual that we had no problem with the council reappointing those individuals to the committee today. We're looking at four new candidates, and again, we have no strong objections, just uh, an observation or two. Uh, first, that one of the youth members indicates in their biography they have graduated from college, which you just heard, uh, implies they will probably age out of the youth seat, which is for people ages 16 to 23, years old um, sometime soon, so they may have to be replaced. Uh, second, a person who was listed last week as a potential new appointee is someone who's declared their candidacy for a seat on city council. There was a lot of debate about whether someone who is on an advisory board like this needs to step aside when running for city office, both at the Citizen Review Committee in the past 10 years and the plans for the new oversight board designed by the Police Accountability Commission. We're glad to see that whatever tensions this person's appointment might have caused are now irrelevant but that does, does mean PCCP will be left with only 12 of 13 allotted members. At the August hearing, Portland Cop Watch also reminded the council that PCCP has been promised to be memorialized in city code so they can continue to work even when the US Department of Justice settlement agreement has been completed and is in the past. PCCP discussed the codification at their September meeting, so we hope this means the logjam is clearing up. At the August Council hearing, we also once again raised the issue that when PCCP gets down to fewer than its allotted 13 members, as it has been for the last month or more, with only eight active members, they should be able to vote on things with a quorum of less than 50% of the number of seats. They were, they were only able to generally support Pastor Wisner's comments to Council about PCCP's support for the oversight plan by the Police Accountability Commission presented on September 21. That was because only five PCCP members were at the meeting the previous day and they were unable to vote. As we've said many times, the quorum should be based on the number of seated members. Uh, this, in, in the September 27th scenario, their quorum would have been five members, the lowest suggested by Copwatch, instead of seven out of 13 when they had, had a total of five ghost seats. Mayor Wheeler's first response was, shouldn't we just fill the seats to prevent the lack of quorum issue? We've heard that before and it's a good goal. The sliding scale 
quorum, however, should be there to protect the volunteers on PCCP so they can keep working if council fails to fill empty seats, as you have um, today one empty seat still. PCCP staff then claim there's an equity issue in the sliding scale because only those with privilege can come to the most meetings. You may know that in early 2022, Mayor Wheeler recommended that PCCP go on a hiatus for 60 days because they were down to seven members. I went back to the meeting notes from that time and found that the members then were Zeynep Balk, Celeste Carey, Gloria Canson, Byron Vaughn, Amy Anderson, Tia Palafox, and Ann Campbell. Of the seven people, four of them are black Portlanders, a city that only has a 6% black population. So in other words, the equity argument doesn't hold water when looking at the real life situation we had just over a year ago. As discussed at the PAC, the sliding scale quorum is practiced by the police review boards in San Diego City and San Diego County. And I'll turn it over to Mark Force again. Thank you. Next up, we have Mark Poors. Hello again, Mayor and Commissioners. My name is Mark Poors. I use he, him pronouns, and I'm with the group Portland Cop Watch. Uh, we also remember that during January of 2017, uh, Mayor Wheeler, in his first month in office, shut down PCCEP's predecessor, the Community Oversight Ad, uh, Advisory Board, COAB, which dwindled to a similarly small size when Council failed to appoint new members. Uh, we agree that there's a place for a committee like this to foster dialogue and understanding between the community and the police, and we hope that Council will not waver on support for PCCEP, regardless of whether you agree with all of their recommendations. Um, it's a very different setting than the new oversight board in the Charter, which was set up specifically for people who feel they've been mistreated in some way by the police to seek redress. Uh, the new system proposed by the Police Accountability Commission thoughtfully considered how a person harmed by police might feel if they know that there are police on the other end of the phone when they call in their complaints and when investigating those complaints. And they also set up systems for community members to resolve those incidents through one-on-one -on -one discussions with police or with their supervisors, rather than heading towards some kind of corrective action if an officer's found out a policy. PCCP's role to develop understanding between the community and the police is crucial to the success of the new oversight system and to the Portland police gaining the trust of the people they're sworn to protect and serve. Again, it relies on two-way communication and not simply the police telling the community that their jobs are difficult. We don't think there's much of an argument about that. But after George Floyd was murdered, a lot of people came to realize that the police as an institution pose a threat of harm to vulnerable members of our community, especially people of color. The new PCCEP members should be able to help the police recognize that crucial perspective so officers can better understand why people aren't always receptive to their presence. Thank you. We actually, I'm sorry, Mayor, we have one other person signed up for right. testimony, uh, Ann Casper. Good morning, Mary Wheeler, Commissioner Matz, and uh, hello. And um, excuse me, I got <laughs> Commissioner Ryan. I'm Ann Casper, she, her, Conager pronouns, a country leader of the Global Mental Health Care Network. Thank you for allowing me to comment today. I agree with these nominations for PCEP. Also, we, the mental health communities, dream one day that PCEP is a safe place for us to speak and that 50% of the members reflect those um, that the PCEP was made for. Those have been directly affected by mental health and justice systems. We dream that the City of Portland also hire us as peers on that PCEP staff. The GOJ process has yet to listen to us, the mental health communities, the very people suit was created for. There's a group that states they speak for us as an amicus party, but they don't allow me or other peers to participate in their meetings. Many good changes have come about because of this process in Portland after the death of James Chassie. I attended the first PSET meeting, which was called something different years ago, and we as mental health advocates were not even allowed to speak at the meeting. The director of Disability Rights Oregon read our comments aloud. To the new members, get to know the other new members, listen to different perspectives, including police perspectives, and change yours if it is best for the community and best for people with mental health challenges. I was the only person with mental, health, with mental health issues invited at the table by Mayor Potter in 2006 after James Chassie's death. And across from me sat the police. I was furious at them. They killed one of us and it could have been me. In the years of being on police and criminal justice committees, I came to know these very, 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 these very people I was furious at. I lost my anger, rolled up my sleeves and we created many good things together, including the ECIT, the Enhanced Crisis Intervention Training, and we had a membership meetings with pe people, people with mental health. The police and they changed me. Portland can be a better place for mental health. Thank you, the new members for volunteering to do this. I have yet wanted to do this as a peer 
as my experience doesn't seem respected there yet, but that's okay. I also encourage you to speak with refugee, immigrant, and asylum community, community members about their needs of police and mental health. So we don't forget the lesson we gained from the Mahez Poot, who was shot and killed in a mental health hospital because he spoke a Mayan language and not Spanish. He didn't understand the instructions. So I ask you to please report out to the mental health communities. We are there. And thank you so much for creating a table where we as peers will feel welcome in the future to join in. And thank you for helping Portland heal. That's it. Thank you. And uh, Commissioner Maps, uh, we'll, we'll get to your question. And colleagues, I want to try and move things quickly so that we can get the officers in the back of the room onto the street before we have to yep. take a break. So Commissioner Maps. Uh, I'd just like to move to accept this report. I'll entertain a second for that. Second. Any further discussion, please call the roll. Maps. Aye. Ryan. Yes, um, thank you all for your service. Um, special acknowledgement to uh, Kip. Thank you so much for um, saying yes to this service. And I did note that both you and Carrie are raising children in our beautiful city. And I, I'm grateful that you bring that perspective to the table. I would I. Wheeler. I want to thank Dory and Samir. I want to thank the, you for the great improvements we've seen over the last year and a half. Uh, as you know, I've increased my direct engagement with PSEP. I've had the opportunity to spend more time with you, and I appreciate it. This appointment is a good one. I vote aye. The report is accepted. The appointment is approved. Thank you. Uh, colleagues, I'm going to skip the second reading and go to right to 831, please. Authorize acquisition of shields for research and development by after. the Special Resources Division. Colleagues, as you'll recall, we recently accepted a report from the Independent Monitor, LLC, that examined the 2020 protests and riots. That report also made recommendations as to how we best prepare our police bureau to support public order events safely and constitutionally while rebuilding a team of officers who specialize in this important work. To that end, the bureau has been working diligently to plan for implementation of these recommendations, including identifying appropriate equipment that reflects best practices for tactical officers. With us today are Commander Craig Dobson, Captain Franz Schoening, and Captain Jake Jensen to tell us more. Welcome, thanks for being here, thanks for your patience. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor, I know we're up against the clock, so I will uh, do the best I can here to get through my remarks. Uh, good morning. Great. My name is Jake Jensen, I'm a captain in the Specialized Resources Division. We had a slight switch on personnel with me today, is Sergeant Andy Kofed and Officer Scott Young. We're the team that's been tasked with rebuilding that special purpose public order team that we were talking about. Uh, when we talk about public order policing, we're talking about police interacting with large groups of people, whether that's at a stadium for an event or a parade going through downtown, or sometimes uh, when those crowds turn violent, we have to address uh, public disorder or riots. Uh, we're talking today about something that we think has potential to make those gatherings, when they do turn violent, safer both for officers and for the community, and that is public order shields. So the proposal today is to purchase 12 shields, four shields of three different models to conduct research and development. Not deployment, simply research and development. Uh, we want to determine what part, if any, shields should have in Pel uh, Portland's public order program. These shields are on the restricted items list, which is why we're here today. We need City Council authorization to purchase these items. Uh, Council Clerk, can you please just move the slide up one? So this is the only slide we have today. I wanted to show you exactly the kind of shields we're contemplating buying. These are special built, uh, special purpose public order shields. They're clear. Some of them are marked with police. They're not ballistically rated, which means that they won't stop bullets. They're designed to stop uh, projectiles, uh, blunt like clubs type of strikes with that. They're fire resistant. And they're designed that way because those are the kinds of hazards that we most commonly encounter in uh, the public order environment when we have to address crowds that are uh, violent with us. Uh, we think there's a high likelihood shields could be useful in this environment because they do provide an increased level of protection. Um, some of these models of shields interlock, and so they allow us to deploy tactics that we wouldn't be able to use otherwise. Um, and because there's such a wide variety of models, shapes, and sizes, we think it's important to have some models to actually have in-house to test to determine which one, if any, suits our needs best. Uh, you can take the slide down now. I'll just proceed with the rest of the presentation. Or you can leave it. It's fine. Okay, thank you. Uh, so shields have long been used in Europe. They're recognized as an emerging best practice here in the United States. Um, and this is a fact, Mr. Mayor, that you noted that was acknowledged by Independent Monitor LLC when they released their report. 
to the recommendation spoke directly to this uh, recommendation two that we need to uh, be better about not relying on dispersals that use riot control agents like CS gas. Having these shields will allow us, because they do increase the amount of protection that we have, to tolerate uh, greater levels of crowd violence before we have to use a tool like CS gas. Uh, recommendation seven says we need to adopt the NTOA guidelines of the National Tactical Officers Association, which is a leading training and standard setting body here in the United States. Uh, they re recently released recommendations for public order teams. They established three levels of teams, basic, intermediate, advanced. Uh, no matter what level of team we contemplate having, we're hoping to, to be able to evolve into an advanced team. Uh, every level of team re is required to have some level of um, profic proficiency with shields. Now, it's, uh, these NTA guidelines are guidelines. They're not standards or requirements, but they are a good indication of what the best practices are here in the US. So uh, if approved, we'd purchase a small number of shields for research and development. If we decided to deploy them, we'd have to come back to city council to look for a <laughs> does, does, does this complete your presentation? Sure. Good. Uh, so what we will do is uh, we'll send you back to the streets. We will uh, continue this item till after the drill.
In session, we were in the middle of item 831, which is an ordinance. We just heard the presentation. Sorry for the interruption. Courtesy of our friends in Washington, D.C. Uh, colleagues, any uh, thoughts before we go to public testimony? Public testimony, please. Uh, first up, we have Mark Porras. Welcome back, Mark. Thanks for your patience. Yep. Uh, hi again, Mayor and Commissioners. My name is Mark Porras. Use he and pronouns, and I'm with Portland Cop Watch. Uh, we appreciate that the ordinance references resolution 37520, which also states that PPB is required to provide a quarterly report to city council detailing the cost and number of each type of military style equipment the bureau intends to purchase. Uh, that resolution also requires the bureau to provide a quarterly report to council on the inventories of their military style equipment. We've not seen those reports and are wondering whether they are accessible to the public. Uh, we hope the term military style equipment makes you flinch the same way it makes us do so. Portland is not a military zone, and despite what some of their training may indicate, PPB officers are not soldiers of war. Uh, we appreciate the mention of the Independent Monitor LLC's recommendations as impetus for this research and development mission. However, none of IMLLC's recommendations mention SHIELDS directly. The titles of the three IMLLC recommendations PPB cited are as follows. 
PPP must dramatically reduce its reliance on crowd dispersals with riot control agents like CS gas at public order events. City must create a new specialized public order team consistent with emerging standards for advanced public order units. Uh, the city must continue to improve its public order training program consistent with recent National Tactical or Officer Association standards. And IMLC made nine other recommendations at the same time, including that PPB must strengthen and clarify its public order and use of force directives. The city must ensure that PPB directives related to internal controls during public order events are followed. PPB policy should require chiefs to be engaged with and visible to officers in the field during public order deployments when possible. PPB should develop a pre-operational briefing checklist and hold supervisors accountable for providing comprehensive briefings to officers before public order deployments. And PPB should formalize the debriefing process for public order deployments. Uh, we remain neutral on the creation of a new riot squad. However, if and when it does happen, the recommendation IMLLC made that we agree with completely is that the new crowd control or public order team must be rigorously scrutinized by PPB executives overseen by Portland's new oversight agency and transparently introduced to the public. Uh, the ordinance states that shields inherently defensive in nature serve a critical role in the domain of crowd management and public order policing. In other words, and as we heard, as we um, heard, the police want these mostly to protect themselves, presumably from objects being thrown at them. Uh, why then do police confiscate shields from protesters who are just trying to protect themselves against unwarranted police violence? Could it be that the state wants to maintain the unrestricted right to inflict harm on community members? And finally, we look forward to the city's self-assessment of the steps that it took to implement Independent Monitor LLC's recommendations. Thank you. Thank you. Next up, we have Danny D. Hello, everyone. My name is Danny D. I am calling in from Seneca, South Carolina. My pronouns are they, them. And I would like to speak um, disagreeance. Um, I do not think that the police should be receiving shields at the moment. Um, I agree with what was said further with what was said earlier that the shields are sort of demonstrating a violence tactic, um, a very heavily defensive militaristic tactic. Um, I do not think that the police should be concerned with defending themselves from um, Portland citizens think that they really have anything to defend themselves from, being that they are highly wielding weapons, um, acting with violence towards the citizens. I would also like to argue that these shields are very easy to turn into a weapon in of itself, and that the police is already highly weaponized and does not really need any further ways in which to harm the public. Um, these shields can be easily turned on their sides, and the edges can be very harmful to individuals when they are struck. Um, they can also allow police to become very close to protesters and use open forces such as punching, kicking, um, tasers. So it really just allows police to get very uncomfortably close to the protesters in order to restrain them. Um, I think that the police should instead be looking at why they find these shields necessary and sort of work backwards from there. So, you know, maybe we need to work on a little bit more of a crowd mitigation, um, how to appease people who are protesting rather than to sort of push them back with more violence. Um, I think that the police should necessarily discover how to mitigate um, and how to reduce crowd attention. Um, rather than further militarizing themselves with more weapons. Um, so once again, I am in opposition of the use of these shields and of the approval of these shields. Thank you. Thank you, Danny. Commissioner Maps. Uh, just a quick clarifying question. Uh, oh, if I said, Danny, do we still have you there? Uh, Commissioner Maps here. Yes, you do. Uh, hi, Danny. I, I appreciate your testimony. Um, I, something did kind of struck, hit my ears. I, uh, you mentioned, I think, that you were in South Carolina. Are you a Portlander? Uh, um, I was just kind of, or are you on vacation or something? I'm not. Um, I would love to be on vacation. I am not on vacation. Um, so I have been a resident of um, Greenville, South Carolina. I've been a resident in Illinois. Um, I've been a resident in Minneapolis. Um, again, in Missoula, Montana, and currently I am in Seneca, South Carolina. Um, I do have a very strong feeling about police brutality and how it is pretty nationwide. And I find that anyone who can uh, attend these public council meetings is um, doing themselves a good favor in order to sort of in themselves into a conversation that they might not see every day. 
Um, so I learn a lot from public testimony. Um, I do thank you for allowing me to be here. Sure, uh, of course, Danny, uh, thank you so much for taking interest in Portland. Thank Thanks. you. Thank you, Danny. Uh, uh, Commissioner Ryan. Yeah, just a couple of clarifying questions and you can probably answer them as the police commissioner. So there's three different styles of these shields that we're, that they're going to test. I know they all, they only had one graphic. So are they all the, yeah, so they're, what am they're, I they're, on? <laughs> they're ba basically they're doing a product test. So they're, okay. they have three different kinds. They're going to use them during training and scenario training and ultimately decide which one they think is, is the best for and them. And they're all the, the longer ones. That I don't know. Okay. I don't know that. I was just, if they were here, I'd just ask, are we moving away from the round shields to these longer ones? That's what I'm trying to get at. Yeah, I, I don't know the answer to that question. Okay. Good we'll find out you. in between. Yeah. We're not voting today, so we can get that yeah. information. Yeah. Okay. Um, thanks. Just trying to get clarification. Good. All right. Thanks. All right. Thank you, everybody. This is a first reading of a non-emergency ordinance. It moves to second reading. Our last item for this morning is a second reading, item number 830. Initiate foreclosure action on certain properties for the collection of delinquent city liens placed against the properties. Any further discussion on this item? If not, please call the roll. Maps. Aye. Ryan. Yeah, this is finally here. <laughs> We're finally voting on this. Anyway, thanks for your hard work. Um, and. I was particularly um, attached to the property on Killingsworth because constituents have been complaining about it for some time. That's why I was asking questions about how long it'll take to, for them to see action. I think they've been fairly persistent and patient. I know a couple people have actually moved out of the area over, over what they would say would be the challenges of living near that house. And so what I've heard is it will be after the sale and um, it could be up to like three to six months. And so I just hope to hear updates on that property in particular, as uh, many constituents have made that a, an issue to me. I vote aye. Wheeler. I want to thank Bridget and the whole team for their hard work on this. Uh, you know, I, I've certainly heard a lot of complaints. Why is it taking the city so long to do this? And I just want to underscore a point I make every time we bring these foreclosures forward, it is designed to be hard for the city to take people's private property. The, the, that is part of the uh, intentionality that goes into this process. It gives people every opportunity to correct the situation, every opportunity to make payments on past due obligations, every opportunity to work with their neighbors. But at the end of the day, if you get onto this list, um, it is because there, there is no hope whatsoever of moving forward on these properties. And so that's where we are with these. Uh, again, um, I would encourage us in the future to put these forward as separate ordinances so that we don't have to keep bringing it back and again and again and again. But other than that, I'm really grateful that we're, we're there. Uh, these properties were, of course, all identified as causing significant problems for neighbors, and they are subject the subject of multiple and frequent police calls and numerous enforcement activities. So this is a step in the right direction. I vote aye. The ordinance is adopted. Thank you, everybody, for your hard work on this. And colleagues, we're adjourned until this afternoon.